Welcome everyone to another episode of Podium Stories. Today we have a very special guest in, in the Zoom building. Uh, his name is Arthur Kroy. He's the CEO and co-founder of KMTX, a fast-growing ad tech company working to provide the main advertising platform of the open web uh, by making it simple for anyone to run campaigns online. Arthur, thank you so much for taking the time. You're welcome. Super happy awesome. to be there. So, I'm happy to have you. Um, I want to start for, if you can give a bit of context to our listeners. Um, can you please share, uh, we just who don't know about you and KMTX, um, what's the purpose of KMTX, how does this solution work, and what problem does it solve? Sure, definitely. Um, so at KMTX, we were building the open web ad platform. Um, so the, the open web is basically everything that's outside of Wall Garden. So outside of uh, Google, outside of Facebook. So any website like the New York Times um, or TMZ, anything that you would uh, look at uh, outside of these, uh, these Wall Gardens. Um, and we want to provide a simple and efficient solution um, to advertise as it is uh, on the Wall Gardens, as it is easy to advertise on Google Instagram um, we want to make it as easy for the open web because at the moment we are ad tech experts um, we used to work a lot uh, into programmatic uh, which is basically the new way of doing online advertising for a lot of advertisers especially the big ones um, but it's super complex like really advertising online is an absolute mess um, when it's on the open web um, it's super costly to operate it's um, really like not efficient to be honest um, and we are trying to solve exactly that uh, making it simple and efficient and going a bit broader than the web uh, we also now work for example on connected TV so we make it as simple as buying Instagram ads uh, to buy um, TV ads online that makes sense uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh one of the powerful aspects of KMTX, I believe, is the AI plus machine learning component. Um, how do you think these two are, are changing the media landscape as we know it and how we uh, are able to buy as online? Yeah. So, on, but to, to, to come back on the, on the Wood Gardens, um, from the beginning, they have built uh, their platform around uh, automation um, and AI, um, which is not true for the open web in general. Um, it's like historically been a very manual process to buy uh, ads for like specific websites. You, at the beginning you had to call or join at least the, 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 the people operating these websites and trying to figure out like a deal to be able to display your ads there. <clears throat> and if you wanted to run ads on like a hundred websites, you had to have conversation with all the websites that you wanted or go through a network that was like not very transparent. It kind of changed with the operation of programmatic and real-time bidding, um, which opened the market um, on, in terms of like automation, but still it's like really inefficient because you have to optimize a lot of things uh, manually um, and it's just like not efficient. You, when you have to optimize your campaign based on the domains that you are targeting, based on the ad placement, based on the segments, based on basically hundreds of dimensions, this is not something a human is made for um, and it's kind of, actually pretty close to high frequency trading that you do in finance like today in finance like all the trading is done by AIs and robots and we are basically applying um, these techniques to um, the advertising landscape and uh, that leads me to a question I want to ask you about um, how much human input uh, is needed because I know we're uh, with AI and machine learning uh, we're able to make more data driven decisions uh, do you think there will be a point where there's less human input needed uh, or no, no human input needed in terms of uh, programmatic ad buying? And uh, at one point, how do you balance the human needs versus the AI component? There, there, there will not be like no more human input because um, advertising has always been about creativity, which basically AI sucks to do that, um, even if you can optimize a few things. but you still have to do great setup to verify that everything is running well and maybe adapt your strategy um, to, to your campaigns. And that's actually the goal, uh, the, the, the main job of advertising agency, it's defining strategies. And now they have to triple shout delivery uh, when it comes to advertising, which just doesn't make sense. Um, and that's where automation um, will like basically 
automation can deliver them uh, from that pain of having to have a lot of expertise uh, to operate uh, this complex stack and more focus on their real job, which is defining strategies and operating strategies seamlessly um, without having to spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out like why is it del not delivering or delivering poorly, um, which is basically 90% of what they, the time they, they spend on the campaign, which is super bad because it's something that could be avoided. And with what we've built, um, we usually spend like 10, 15 minutes to set up a campaign, which is super quick when we know obviously what we want to do and we and we're able to do some very like complex setup, you know, in this time frame. When you use uh, like traditional uh, system, takes like, hours uh to to set up um and and requires a lot of expertise so and and especially it's especially important now as a lot of advertisers want to internalize um the 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 open web ad buying um and you just as a brand you just don't do it like uh with the current stack you won't you don't want as a brand to go and say okay i want a dsp a dmp an ad server an ad verification system no you just want to an ad platform that does it and that does it well. And that's exactly what we provide. We make it super simple and efficient. Yeah, so there's a science and there's an art, right? And I think you have to take care of Ex the Exactly, and yeah, we, we just absorb the complexity and we absorb it not with like uh, humans on our side, we, we absorb it with AI and tech and automation. Yeah, it, it's interesting because we hear that often of, you know, AI is taking over versus AI is helping us do what we do best, right? Which is to find a strategy, to find a creative, and then we'll let AI machine learning take the, the heavy lifting from a science standpoint. Yeah, one, one of the things, like a lot of startups I hear and, and work with, usually a lot of them will tell you, oh yeah, so with AI, you'll be able to not have like this role in your company anymore. And usually they sell it to the same person, which is basically, well, if you, like by this solution that will kill your job, which is a, <laughs> a super bad pitch. Um, and ours is more like part of your job, you would like to concentrate much more on what you know how to do, but you have to spend 90% of your time on things you don't want to do. And we just reduce those 90% to maybe 10% so that you can focus on things where you bring real value um, and, and where it's pleasurable to work. I love that. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great way to put it. Um, it was interesting because I was reading on, on your, the about page on your website um, that one of, and I, I'll quote, so you tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but one of the first things our, your CDO, Frank, um, told you was uh, when you guys met in 2013 was don't ever build an ad tech company and then ended up building an ad tech company. Um, can you tell us a bit more about, uh, you know, the challenges that you faced um, to get KMTX started and rolling, and why did you decide that this was a problem that you wanted to solve yep. and move forward with? Yeah, so when when Frank told me that uh, he, he had already built an ad tech company before, um, and, and at that time I was building my second company, uh, and that was an ad tech company, I decided to do it anyway. Um, it, ad tech is a very, very challenging market because basically you are fighting with overfunded company and i'm not even talking about facebook and google there like really really big company and then like the the majority of the market is owned by google facebook amazon and, and everything so first it's a it's it's very hard to uh fit there uh it's also a, a market where you have to know the people you have to know the codes uh you don't just like get in like this because you will make a lot of mistakes i've made so many mistakes on my first uh, ad tech company. It, it was successful anyway, but the beginning was very rough. Like, for example, we went directly to some advertisers and I was like called by a, a media agency telling me just like, how, why? Like, why did you do that? <laughs> Are you just crazy? Like, <laughs> do that again and we'll just basically kill you. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, my, bad, my, bad. <laughs> my bad, I didn't know that. They're, they were kind of confrontive, but still, like there, there are codes that you, you have to um you have to understand. Um legally, uh it's also fast moving on this side because privacy is getting more and more important for good reason. Uh, but you have to adapt on that and it's often like not super clear like the 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 action you should take and everything. 
um, and um, and yeah, and, and and everything is moving constantly. Uh, there are a lot of people, whether it be on the demand side, on the supply side, a lot of things to understand, uh, which makes it super hard uh, to to operate. Oh yeah, and by the way, VCs hate ad tech. It's getting better, but like for a long time they hated ad tech. So it was get very very difficult to get funded, uh, and and for very cash intensive operations. So it's kind of the whoa. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, but yeah, so that's that's pretty much all the challenges. We're, often when we when we talk with Hank, uh, my founder, we often say it's kind of like playing video games on super hard mode. Like <laughs> that's funny. Uh, but, but there's all these challenges, and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna do that again. Uh, why uh, why was KM, uh, KMTX out of all the? I'm sure as an entrepreneur, you have all these problems that you want to solve in the world. Um, why move forward with this knowing that it's going to be in hard versus going for something yep. that's a bit more low hanging fruit? Sure, sure. Um, th there is something about the ambition. Um, and and one of the things that we often talk about and with, with Frank is the inevitable. Um, the inevitable is uh, something, obviously, that like will happen at some point. Uh, and it's super important when you are an entrepreneur to work on the inevitable. Frank, in the past, uh, is kind of like always sick, at least in his head, uh, and is always booking appointments with doctors. And he was, at some point, there will be a platform where you can book appointments with doctors super easily. Um, and he created a company called Doctolib. Uh, that became a unicorn in France. Um, and that's pretty much the same thing we're doing here. It's just saying like, it's inevitable that at some point, the ad platform of the open web will exist because like it has to be simple. And there are so many brands that want to advertise, but on, on the open web, uh, for example, like a luxury brand would like to advertise on Vogue, but they either have to go to Vogue and pay probably like 100K or 200K uh, but that's just way too much. Or they have to sign agreements for getting like the whole stack of DMP, DSP, et cetera, that will cost them million per year just to buy ads on Vogue. Like that's kind of super overkill. Um, so there is like in the middle, there is the ad platform where you just connect, set maybe 5,000, 10,000 K budget and test and you see if it works on Vogue or not. And that's where it gets interesting. And that's inevitable that at some point, that simple and efficient platform will exist. The hard part is making it efficient and simple because it's a very complex market to operate. And even though you are able to simplify that, you have to like make it efficient. And that's what we've succeeded to do. Like we now work with 300 advertisers. We've beat every com every competitor in the market over like 1,500 campaigns. So we're very confident about that the tech works. And that's why now we're scaling uh, the the operations and the and the platform. I love that. Yeah, it, there's something to be said about decentralizing everything, right? Like everything that has a central power can can be uh, decentralized. And it seems like you guys have been able to open source that uh, with your platform. I, I know with Motion. Uh, lead uh, your first company. Yep. Um, there were a lot of lessons that we talked about, about a few of them. Uh, how was the experience of merging and getting acquired? And then I'll also ask you about, let, let's start with that. How was the experience of like merging, getting acquired after you've built something and and you take that step of deciding to, to exit? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, merger and acquisitions are a very, uh, a very important thing uh, when you're entrepreneurs, because most of in most of the case, um, that will be uh, the final step. Is your company is a bit successful? Obviously, like 90% of the startups die. So yeah, when when you get it out of the picture, like in the 10% left, like probably 90% of those will get acquired in some ways, um, and maybe like a few will maybe uh, go public or this kind of thing. But that's another specter of the story. So. Getting acquired is very important because it will. You, one of the thing is most of the time you will get an earn out. So you will have to stay in the company that acquires you for two years. Let's say two years. It may, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but usually it's around two years. That's a very that can be very painful and difficult, especially when you're an entrepreneur, because like you're, it's not your company anymore. Um, 
you now have people telling you what to do uh, and sometimes it can be super frustrating. So it's super important to be sure that you are getting acquired by a company that will um, fit uh, your vision and your mindset and everything. So because even though they might offer you a lot of money to like stay in the company, um, because that turnout, like at the end of the earnout, usually they pay you the most. Um, but if you don't go, like if you don't reach the end of the earnout, like you won't get everything. But a lot of entrepreneurs actually just like leave before the end of the earnout because they just can't stand the companies right. they uh, that have acquired them. It it actually like I think it's one of the founder of WhatsApp. He just like left a billion on the table just because he wasn't aligned with the company. So obviously, I already took a few billions so that helps but still like i don't think it was in a bad spot but he could have been yeah there was yeah still yeah that that's still a billion on the table <laughs> that's still a lot of money um and so so yeah it's very important to to find a company that um that 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 will occur you that's in line uh, that's in line with you um Another thing is uh, being sure that you want to sell and usually you're not the only one taking that decision. You can have investors, you can have um, co-founders and it's very important to discuss that uh, a lot to be sure that everyone is aligned and everyone agrees on that because it can create uh, a lot of conflict uh, as well. So getting acquired for us at Motion Lead um, was, uh, we had the chance to have a lot of like people approaching us and at some point uh, we felt like we had reached a plateau in terms of business model and it was kind of the question of should we raise or should we have an early exit um, and as, as we were not as expert as we are now on the on the market the most secure option and we were very young so the most secure option was to early exit and stay with the company and we found a company that actually at the beginning, we didn't think at all that they would acquire us because we had so much bigger companies talking with us as well, but we fitted the most uh, with them. And we would keep control, create a whole offer uh, in the company. Uh, and actually one of my co-founder at the time is still with them uh, now over like, what's that? Like six years later. So it means that it we, 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 yeah, it worked out. Um, and, and at KMTX, we, we kind of had like that same, uh, question because like we 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 grew the revenue super fast so obviously that we could have like go through a, an early exit um, and and yeah you take the cash and and everything's fine but the 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 acquirers uh, that were that approached us were like not super interesting for us to go work to we didn't feel like we were aligned or anything like that and even if the cash was good we have super talented team that we love to work with every day. We have super high ambition. We know we have the assets to go where we want to go. So we'll probably just raise a lot of money in the coming months um, and operate and fulfill our vision of that inevitable ad platform um, that will exist at some point. So so yeah, that's that's the 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 the, the very important part is like getting aligned with the acquirer and yourself uh, about what you want to do. That makes sense. And, and you guys, it's interesting how uh, different situations require different decisions, right? Back then, that was the right choice to make. And at this point, you guys go in a different direction. Yep. Um, and I have a couple more questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, about raising money, and that's something that uh, I like to talk a bit about. Uh, I know this is something that you guys are uh, doing in the upcoming months. Uh, what are some of the things that for maybe entrepreneurs that are just starting and want to raise money, uh, what are some of the lessons that you would say, I wish I would have known that back then, or what are some of the things that you take into consideration right now as you guys are raising um, that you think puts you in a better position? Sure. Network is probably the most important uh, in that one. Um, I see a lot of entrepreneurs going to VCs, like sending an email like, dear sir or madam, and like hoping to get answers. I think the, the first test uh, when you are trying to reach uh, VCs or investors um, is the networking test. Like, are you good enough in networking to get in touch with these people? Um, and that's that's a simple like filter in some ways uh, for for the VCs. So definitely like you, you, you should always go through an intro. Like 
always, uh, never cold reach. Um, because I mean, you can try and, and you'll find counter examples, obviously. Um, but like, don't cold reach, always like figure out how to find intros. Um, our, our first raise was kind of easy because like track record helps a lot and it's very important at early stage i would say up to series a included um to always always demonstrate uh, your track record and it's always about the story you tell so yeah um so yeah track track record is very very important obviously if you have like executed companies before exceeded companies before mm -hmm. like getting a seed like should not be really an issue. Um, maybe something we don't do enough um, and when it comes again to networking is like often discuss uh, with a short list of uh, investors um, so that when you want to raise, they have seen your progression um, and, uh, and, and they're usually, they will usually be faster to, to, to pull the trigger rather than like the one that like don't right. know you from, from anywhere. Um, and then, like, yeah, I, I would say like ambition is always something that people uh, will value and like. Um, I, I see a lot of companies um, going, trying to raise um, and sometime with small, like small rounds because they are kind of afraid to ask for more um, and either end up raising like with like, tier B or tier C VCs because they, 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 they will need to raise more and they, they are investors who will be happy to take a lot of like, <laughs> uh, yeah. percentage of your company, um, and, and know that will, you, you will have to raise again. Um, and, and they could have raised more and enough, uh, for what they do is they were just kind of scared to ask for more. Um, and, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's a very like important thing. So don't be afraid to ask like for for like the amount that you need. Like don't ask for like the ridiculous amount that you don't need, obviously. Um, but uh, but yeah, and 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 a lot of like um, hate a tier A tier VC will will also look for the ambition um, of execution. And and some yeah, some companies will like sometimes ask for like 300, 400k uh, to to run a business and and get started quick when they should mainly focus, and that's that's a VC that told me that and, and actually strongly agree, so I'm not even like pulling it out, mm -hmm. pulling it out of my hat. Like it's, it's really like a VC who told me that and, and, and they should focus on like spending six months finding like top tier uh, co-founders, like I don't know, COO of a big startup or this kind of thing um, and then go and raise like 10 million instead of like trying to raise like 30, like 300, for like yeah because because in a lot of like very operation intensive companies you need to go fast like right. and 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 with 300k like what what will you even try to prove like it's, it's just yeah. too small and you that and you sense. just get dilution so right um and we have a couple of minutes um i know you were at a white commander and you spent time in in san francisco uh, but you're originally from France. I, I think it, we have a similar European to America story. Uh, what are the differences between European entrepreneurship and American entrepreneurship that you've seen? Um, ambition. Ambition, right? One hundred percent ambition. Like I've seen that too. I I I I often tell that like uh, in in the company like we should act like Americans. Like I mean, Europe is cool and everything. Um, and, and, and I've been shocked by some American told me like, for example, like France is a city market, like at YC, <laughs> one of the partner, I won't say who, but one of the partner at YC told me France is a city market. So that was a bit rude because you know, like France, everything. <laughs> it's my country. But, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's my country, but, but yeah, I mean, he's right, in some right. ways, like he's <laughs> right. Like uh, in some ways he's right. And, and yeah, ambition is like probably the, the thing that like changes like everything and and a lot of French company and European company will focus on micro markets and 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 they will focus on their own market and be like very uh, self centered uh, when when in the u s it's really the opposite it's like it's so big um, that you you have to look big uh, even if you're not um, you have to act big and and live up to it 
um, and so the the challenge is like obviously harder, um, but yeah, it's just like so, it's so much preferable to work this way because like um, you you kind of dream as well a bit, um, but everything is possible. Like everything is possible, and and that's very cool uh, compared to um, like in in France where like yeah sometimes it's just like too small yeah. and and too self centered. For us, we only work with American clients because of that reason. Um, and I love Spain, but we don't work with Spanish clients. Um, and I've seen the same thing. Ambition, and it's okay to fail. It doesn't mean anything bad about you. Like, people want you to yeah. fail. And yeah, and, and, and what helps is that the market is so big that even if you fail with some client, you, you will still be able to make up. I have to agree yeah. on the fact that in Europe, sometimes market is so small that everybody knows together and... And sometimes if you fail with one client, like yeah, it can be terrible on the on the on the rest. So. Yeah, Arthur, thank thank you so much for being here. I think we could talk for hours, uh, but I, I yeah. know you're busy and it's the end of the day in Europe. Um, what, other than we're gonna put the key MTX uh, website link on the description for people to check it out. Um, what are other ways that people can connect or reach out to you? Sure, definitely. Um, so my email is arthur at kmtx.com. Um, obviously, uh, one of the we'll launch in the beginning of June in the US a platform to buy um, TV ads, so connected TV ads, uh, super simply. So just like you buy ads on Instagram, but for TV. So we're launching like beginning of June. If that interests you, contact me at arthur.kmtx.com. Um, and we are always looking for talents uh, all around the world. So we're um, uh, remote first. Uh, so we hire like whether it be like in Asia or in the US or pretty much anywhere. So if you are a tech talent, if you are a talent, if that what we do talks to you and interests you, just contact me and I'll be super happy to talk with you. I love that. And I know people on Arthur's team and I can vouch for them. So if you are interested in that, I can highly, highly vouch for, for Arthur and, and what they're doing. Arthur, again, thank you so much for, for joining Thanks us. Thanks a lot, Martin. It was a pleasure talking to you. Same. Awesome. Cheers. Bye -bye.